This time on Low Buck Garage, I use a sink instead of a radiator. I do some engine work, and I make a mess of a new rim. Soon that grease will be sprayed all around the wheel, but that's okay. In the last video working on this truck, I pulled the engine out of it. It's still out. I considered my options, and I figured probably the best thing to put in here is another engine. Seems like the best choice. Now at the end of the last video, I showed you a photo of one I had a line on. Uh, the seller told me it didn't currently run, he had never heard it run, and I'd need four-wheel drive in order to pick it up. And checking location, it'll be over a five-hour drive to pick it up. So uh, basically it's perfect. So now we have to go retrieve it. I figure I want a small trailer, so I'm not bringing my regular car trailer. Uh, I'm going to use this one. So I'm going to go ahead and put some new tires on this. Yep, date code's 1987. Still hold air though. I'm going to hang on to these. Now hopefully you realize that when I said I was going to put new tires on it, I didn't mean like actual new tires that are bought from a store. I'm stealing it from a trailer. I put new tires on about four years ago. So I'm stealing these tires. There's a trick to dealing with these lug bolts. Normally on the trailers, the hub is much smaller than the rim, so the pattern doesn't line up. And you could try to hold it in place, but that's a real pain to get the bolt in. It's not like studs, you can slide it over. As you turn it, you can see the hub turns at a different speed. So you can rotate it around to get one to line up. Now people have a tendency to flip it up, and then you can kind of pivot it back and forth until you get the other ones to line up. But do the opposite go to the bottom. That way the hub doesn't try to turn all the way to pushing it down. And then you can line them up real easy. It doesn't try to flip back and forth. When I was putting the tire on this little trailer, I went and spun it. It's a little bit growly. Not bad, but not good. I'm supposed to leave in 15 minutes, probably less by now. I don't really have time to put new bearings in. So what I did is digging through my stash of parts, I found a bearing buddy kit, which uh, for some reason I had just one, but that's what I need here. They replace your dust cap, you pump the whole thing full of grease, and there's actually a spring. You can see it moves, and the spring pushes the grease in constantly as you drive. Hopefully this will take care of it long enough to get this engine picked up. All right, let's fill her up. So the grease is pushing that piston out, There. Got this filled up to the point where it's oozing out a weep hole here. That's my best shot without changing the bearings. So I'm hooking the trailer up to my wife's car because she gets a reliable one. And I noticed the trailer connector is missing a prong entirely. And that's the one for the running lights. I was supposed to leave 10 minutes ago. Uh, now I'm going to put a new connector on. There we go. New connector added. Let's hope this one works. We're good.
got my engine. Uh, didn't get any video because I was worried about not falling off a cliff. So, supposed to go up the hill. And finally, we go down the hill. Don't worry about the engine falling off the cliff. All I have to do is get it home. This bearing is nice and cool, so that fixed did it. You can see how far the grease cap went in already. So that pumps some grease through those bearings. I made it back successfully. Engine's here. Tire stayed cool. Bearing stayed cool. Uh, worked out great. It was a really nice guy. Not only did I get the engine, he gave me a pile of spare parts. I don't even know exactly what I have, but in the daylight tomorrow, we'll figure it out. I unpacked most of the stuff I got. Uh, let me show you. We got the engine, which we expected. And then we got air filters, extra bolts, brand new ignition stuff, lots of bolts and labeled bags, new gaskets, new switches, flywheel, bell housing, another head, exhaust pipe, manifold set, water pump for the old style, water pump for the new style, new style pulley, old style pulley, rocker arms, uh, starter, I think that's a 12 volt, starter, I think this is a 6 volt, generator, 6 volt high amperage, I think it's 45 amps, another manifold with carburetor. The seller gave me a sprayer in case I needed to degrease the motor. He was a real nice guy. Uh, carburetor, another carburetor, uh, propane system, and well, lots of stuff. After I bought this, I decided to figure out what I actually bought because I figured I might want to know that at some point. Uh, the thing that concerned me was this water pump. Notice how the water pump is pretty far from this pulley. That indicates this is an older block, like the uh, Babbitt bearing low pressure lubrication motors. They have this kind of spacing. Then there's a gap where you can see a freeze plug and then the water pump above that. On the block I had in there, which is a series two block, you see the harmonic balancer, you see the uh, timing chain cover, the water pump's immediately above it. There is no gap there. So that water pump is significantly lower, which means your fan is significantly lower. So I ran the block numbers. And it turns out this block is a 1954. From what I understand, that is the last year of this high water pump, but in one of the first years for the uh, high pressure oiling. This is the fan position the truck was originally designed for. So this will actually work better than the lower water pump because it centers that fan up on the radiator position. The other thing I found is this head is not from this block. This is a later model head. Uh, it is a higher compression head I believe it was used from 56 to 62 or so. And this should be the highest compression the factory ever put on it. So the combination of the high compression head, the taller water pump, and the full pressure lubrication means that uh, this is a pretty decent motor for this truck. This is one of the better ones I could have. So first thing I'm gonna do is pull all the plugs, add oil in each cylinder, because I know this thing's been sitting a long time and I wanna give it the best shot possible at surviving here. Looks basically just dry and a little carbony, so like a normal engine running rich. I can work with that. Oh yeah, not half bad. Haven't seen rust yet. All right, she's turning. So far I haven't heard any weird clunks. I don't think I've got a full rotation on this. I think we're in good shape. Now I'm gonna try putting the old uh, water pump pulley back on this. Obviously someone took it off for a reason, and I don't know what that is, so I'm gonna put it back on and find out the hard way. We're just going to gently press this pulley on. That went on almost too easy. Oh, the pulley is bent. That's wobbly. All right, there's some issues here. We're just going to ignore those for now. The belt might stay on. Got my stash of used belts here. Let's try this one. Let's see what happens. Not that one. We'll pick that up later. Definitely need a smaller one. This looks real promising. Oh yeah. That's the one. Now these are the two starters I got with this. And uh, I assume they both would work. But I went and looked. They have two different pinion gears. Now this is my old engine. I'm going to pull out the starter and take a look at the gear and the flywheel and see if they look like the new one. I set this motor on a tire. I can't get the box end of the wrench on the bolt. Oh, can I? Nope. It's too close to the starter. I can't sneak that in there. And I can't use the open end because I hit the tire. So I had to move this motor anyway, just means it's happening now. The starter appears to be rusted in place. We'll just encourage it to free up. 
There we go. Come on. There we are. All right. Oh, that thing's full of dirt. Nice. This is my old flywheel. And this is my new flywheel. Got all three of my starters here. Here's the one that came off the truck. Here's the ones I got. Uh, we have coarse pitch gear, coarse pitch gear, fine pitch gear. So that's my starter. Even though I think it's six volt and it has a solenoid on it, and I'm not sure how that's gonna handle 12 volts because I don't have a six volt battery. We'll find out. If we see smoke, we'll stop. Got some battery wires hooked up. I think we're ready to crank it over. I'm just gonna check the oil and make sure it has some. Well, we got oil, nice and black, so we're set there. Found my old uh, motor's repair manual from 1963. I know that motor's a 54 block, but they have all the neat stuff, like, you know, how to identify your grill and things like that, in case you're not sure what car you have. Something along those lines. Ah, right, here we go. Ground polarity. They have a 53 Corvette in here. That's about right, and they say it's negative ground, so we're going with that. And let's see what happens. It moves. There we go. It turns over. That's a good sign. How hot's the starter? That's not hot. I think it'll work for a while on this 12 volts. And apparently, that's where the oil pressure center is supposed to go. So I'm going to put something in there. See if I have a spare gauge lying around. Digging through my spare gauges here, I'm not finding a spare oil pressure gauge. There's one in the set, but I won't be able to screw it directly into the block. I'm sure I got one around here somewhere. But what I did find, while I was poking through here, let me sneak over to this side. I did find an old distributor cap from a Ford 300. This is part of the J10 project and some stuff you haven't seen yet that I've done to the truck. There's five plug wires here, which is most of them. So I just need to find one extra. I'm sure there's one around here somewhere. I just remembered that I got a gauge left to this forklift transmission from when I was testing the clutch pressure. So we're just going to steal this. This will be perfect. There we go. I was hooking up my nice matching set of spark plug wires and uh, I found I couldn't quite fit one in that hole. It looks like there's still an old spark plug wire in there. You can see I can use an old wood screw and catch the insulation. Yep, there we go. So there's the old one. It fits. On this positive side, I'm just shoving a bare wire in. Just pull the wire under, tighten it down. It's just electricity. Not like it's anything critical. There we go. The negative side gets grounded with the points. So we're just gonna go with an alligator clip. Another alligator clip here. And uh, we have a complete ignition system. I also have an inline spark tester. So we're gonna pop that in here. Now what I've done is I've hooked the ground of the test light to the positive. So now I touch ground and uh, I've got a connection. So we go to the points. And right now I have them closed. They're connected. Open them. So it actually looks like this is working. Let's crank it over and see what happens. Yep, we got spark. So next we need fuel. I got a few carburetors here that could work. Uh, this is the one that was closest to me, so I'm going to install it. And something like that. Probably need some nuts there. Might be a little bit of vacuum leak as is, because it's a bit wobbly. Now I'm gonna pour the gas somewhere in the general area of this opening in the carb. I'm actually gonna aim for the vent, the fuel bowl vent, but only, usually only about, let's say a third goes in there. The rest just pours right down it. That'll be fine. This isn't actually tied down, so I'm just gonna put my hand here to steady the engine. I'm sure that'll be fine. <laughs> Well, that was uh, promising. Also, I heard some massive clunking, which was not promising. 
I think this may have been the clunking I heard. Oh yeah, that'll work. There, that looks secure-ish. That'll be fine. I didn't hear any clunking that time. That sounds pretty decent. All right, let's see if we can keep it running for a little bit. Well, we've got a running engine. That's surprisingly good. Okay then, on to the next step. After running it, I looked at this and it looks like the pulley was out further than I had originally installed it. And then I wiggled it. The whole thing's wobbling on the shaft. I knew that went on way too easy. Now these are the motor mounts the truck uses, which bolt to the side of the bell housing. I have a bell housing on this one, but there's nowhere to bolt those two, which means I can't use that bell housing. I've got to steal that one. Now, in order to change bell housings, the reason I didn't separate this in the truck to take it out is I can see two bolts here, but it looks like it's bolted from the inside here and here. So it looks like you have to remove the flywheel in order to take the bell housing off, but there's a problem. In order to take the flywheel off, we've got to take the pressure plate off, which has bolts all around, including in here. Now I expect the way this is intended to be done is you just rotate the flywheel around to get to the bolts. But this engine doesn't rotate because it's completely seized. So I have to figure out how to take the bolts off that are inside this in order to get to the bolts that hold this on, which are also inside it, that I can't get to with this on. So this might get a little tricky here. I'm going to start with the things I can get to, then we'll worry about what I can't. Now it seems like a new orientation is needed here to get to this a little better. I think we're taking out the crank. It'll be interesting to see what's under the soil pan anyway. We got, we can't remove it. There's something inside. I'm sure you're supposed to be able to remove these. Seriously, how would this be attached from the inside? Why can't I remove this? Well, got a little more movement. There we go. Well, nice. Okay. There's still water in there. Guess it didn't all drain out. The inside doesn't look nearly as rusty as I expected. A little bit sludgy. Just a tad but not rusty. Take a look at these bearings. A few grooves, but not that bad. This number five piston that looked pretty good before actually moved. One of these pistons was not seized, which is nice. Just took off a main cap. It's got a shim under it. Now I got the main caps unbolted. That one appears to be attached to the front motor plate. And it looks like I can't remove the train shaft without taking the front of the motor apart. Um, which I don't want to do. But what I'm going to try doing is turning it and maybe I can angle it up enough to get this to turn around to get to those other bolts. All right, so I put that that way and then it should rotate this way, except for those other ones that are stuck. I found a medium sized drift here. I got four pistons out, there's two left and I'm finally able to turn this thing. So. Bolts are coming out. I am down to one bolt left on that pressure plate. And I cannot get to it because I'm hitting one rod or the other. Now, let me show you what I just noticed. There's a cover there. If we can line that bolt up with that cover, we might be able to take it off that way. That one's not it. There it is. We can get to it, I think. 
the socket doesn't physically fit in there. Um, if anyone told me yesterday that I would be on day two of trying to remove a bell housing and still not having a good way to do it, I wouldn't have believed him. I do now though. I think I have a plan. I'm going to go with a tiny little 3 8 socket, sneak it at an angle in there, then with a smaller extension I can straighten it out, and then we'll see how fast it explodes with an impact. Got loose. Can't actually remove the socket now, but I think I can get the pressure plate out. There we go. I have to remove the extension. That's good enough. It's moving a little bit. Something's stuck. Why is it stuck? I have no idea what's going on here. It appears the disc has gotten wedged in here. Come on, there we go, maybe. We have a piece removed, finally. Oh, we're on a roll now. Now, the flywheel bolts have locking tabs, so I've got to flatten out the locking tabs on this before I can remove the bolts. One, two, three. Good thing there isn't 12 of these. Oh yeah, there's 12 of these. All right, there's the last bolt. Oh yeah, it's moving. There we go. One flywheel. Now, we have to get to the bolts that we wanted to get to originally. That started this whole thing. And there are four bolts under this flywheel. Oh yeah, it's moving. Being gentle, if I crack this, I'll be very sad. There we are. We got it. I've actually trapped my boot in the pallet because the motor slid over. Good thing I have protective footwear, but... All right. Alternate method. I don't think this day is done with me yet. All right. Release the boot. There we go. We're free now. Ah. Now I'm kind of curious about the seam on this oil pan here. So uh, let's clean that up a little. Now this is a World War II vintage oil pan. And what they did, and apparently this was done from the factory, is they took regular oil pans and added a sump to them. And the way they did it, they basically just brazed it together. When it didn't fit, they just hammered it till it did fit and braze it together. That's like wrinkles here, just filled with braze. Uh, that didn't happen afterwards. That was brazed in place with all those lumps in it. So that was a factory production piece. And looks like a little cast brass piece that was riveted in. Now the inside here is nice and smooth. Now when I saw this, I expected to find a seam like this on the inside, but that's not a seam. This is the original oil pan. Look at the height there. That bottom of the pan is still there. They added another sump on the bottom. They just cut a hole through it. That's why I had trouble getting this off the uh, oil pickup. So basically the oil comes down, goes in the original pan, goes through that hole, and then fills up this entire sump area. Which means, if this truck's at a weird angle or something like that, that's going to trap a lot of oil. So that oil pickup would be in oil at all sorts of extreme angles because it actually is a separate chamber from up top here. Kind of an interesting design. Now I want to remove this pickup for the deep sump and I couldn't figure out how to remove it. I looked all around on this side, saw nothing. On this side, saw nothing. Out here there's a couple rivets that you can't remove. So I couldn't figure out how to take this out until I got the crankshaft to turn. This huge counterweight here was blocking my view of that bolt right there. So that looks like what holds in this whole oil pump. There we go. There we go. Got it out. So apparently this bolt holds in that hole 
through the block from the inside. Now that I have the bell housing off the old engine, I need to put it on this engine. Now this one does turn, so it's going to be a lot easier, but everything still is going to need to go in from the bottom. Uh, the pressure plate, the flywheel, all that has to come off this engine. The bell housing has to be bolted in with bolts you only can get to from the bottom. And uh, then everything else has to go back in from the bottom. So sitting on a pallet is definitely not the ideal way to do this. So in order to make my life easier, what I'm going to do is uh, I've already stripped off some of the accessories on this side. I'm going to go ahead and paint the block. And that way I'm going to have soft and possibly tacky paint to deal with on the block while I work with everything underneath. Brake clean and a wire brush seem a perfectly good way to prep this. So I'm going to pop off this nice shiny valve cover. Let's take a look at what we got under there. It's a little sludgy, but I definitely see oil over everything, so that'll be fine. I took an air hose to my old valve cover. We're going to pop this on here just for uh, painting so I don't get the new one a new color. Found some cast iron color engine paint. Everything's going to be cast iron. You can be cast iron, and you can be cast iron, and you can be cast iron. Spark plugs can be cast iron. Perfect. I think I'm finally done with this one, so we can get out of here. I got a, a water pump with this, and it has the remains of a sticker that says remanufactured. They may have used gravel instead of ball bearings. Um, that's not right. Most of the way, now I gotta get the last little bit. I'm not just hoarding old rusty nuts and bolts that have no use. I'm saving good spacers for just an occasion like this. Yeah, that's why I keep cans full of them. There, let's see if this will work now. There we go. Got our pulley. Not too rusty. I ran out of the cast iron colored paint on the block, so I started going with the semi-gloss black here, which I think will be fine. At least this one looks straight. I've got most everything attached again. Um, I gotta put the starter in, but that bolts to the bell housing, and I still gotta change the bell housing. I've been putting that off as long as possible, but it's the next thing I gotta do, so I gotta do it. That looks secure. Couple teeth at a time. Eventually this will get done. Yep. Now I'm not sure if this flywheel is balanced with the crank, but I know the timing marks are on the flywheel. So we're gonna mark this to make sure I put it back on the same way. Then we'll do some dots here. And we'll do a zigzag here. That way, I can tell what's what and get this line back the same way. You know, I expected this engine to be simpler to work on than a modern one, but uh, in a lot of ways, it's not. There we go. I attacked the old bell housing with some spray paint while I was at it. That's why it looks kind of shiny. Now, on critical bolts like this that hold the engine and transmission together, particularly ones that are hidden inside the bell housing you'll never get to again, there's always a torque spec. Um, I don't know what the spec is. I know there is one, but I'm just going around. I tightened the ball and then I just went around and gave him another little tweak. That should be fine. This is the flywheel I just pulled off with my markings to put it on exactly the same way. I'm not installing it. The reason for that, this is the clutch that came off it. This is the clutch that came with the truck. This one's a 10 inch. This one is 11. So, uh, that's one bigger. Also, Notice you can still see ink stampings on there. That clutch has almost no time on it. That ink would be gone if this had a lot of use. So someone put a new clutch in. Now the bolt pattern on this is larger. You can see these holes are real close to the edge. 
On this 10 inch one, they're a lot further away. I'm not using the one I marked. I am using one I didn't mark, so I gotta figure out where that should go. What I'm gonna do is flip this over. And somewhere on here, oh, there we go. There are the markings. Let me spin it around. There's markings on the back side of this flywheel. So I'm gonna line up these markings on this one, which has them somewhere. Somewhere, oh, there we go. They're right there. So I'm gonna line up that mark and then transfer my marks to the other side as to where to put it on the crankshaft. Well, I got the paint marker out. I'm gonna make these timing marks a little more obvious. I'm gonna leave the old ones there, but make another mark next to them. So now I can see the original one and the bright indicator that can get me in the ballpark. I actually did look up the torque spec for the flywheel bolts because uh, this thing's going to be spinning at some seriously high speeds, probably up to 3,000 RPM or so. There we go. Now I'm working on these locking tabs, which are a real pain to try to fold over. So what I did is took one of my bent screwdrivers because of course I hang on to those too, and I can use it to kind of pry up under here and get it started. Once you start bending it a little bit, then I can use the other end as a ramp and tap the screwdriver. And that gets it most of the way. Then I can use it backwards again, use the tip on the edge to drive it into place. There, got them all. Every bolt has at least one tab on a flat, so we should be in good shape. Luckily, in the pile of stuff I got with this engine, there's a clutch alignment tool. Going this way. Come on, there we go. We're getting somewhere. Everything's falling. There we go. Pressure plate is on. Clutch tool is out. And it's just as simple as that to swap out a bell housing on a stove bolt Chevy. Yep. Now I've hooked up everything else, uh, including the fuel pump. Now I don't know if it works, but I hooked it up and we got a clear filter, so we'll see if fuel pumps through it. I've got the alligator clips back on the ignition. We're pretty well set. Now, I don't like running these motors without water in them. They don't heat up instantly, but you get localized hot spots. The water inside it is meant to even out the temperature, not just keep it cool. So I need to hook up the cooling system. Now, I have learned something over the years. I've taken a lot of old motors and I hook them up to a brand new radiator and immediately the accumulated dirt inside the engine pumps directly into the radiator and fills up a brand new radiator with dirt. I've also learned that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have to do something different. So I'm gonna add a sediment trap to it instead of a radiator. Luckily, when I remodeled my bathroom a few years ago, I didn't throw out the sink. Uh, they have outlets that are the perfect size for radiator hoses it's gonna pull from the drain and go through the water pump. Then it's gonna come out, it'll dump through here, and then I could trap all the dirt or flush it or do whatever I want, because it's sort of an open system. And uh, it will warm up eventually, but I'm gonna have a lot of running time on this before it gets too hot. Time to fill the coolant system. That's easy. We get this the sink up to a level above the water pump. Uh, this should work out great. Let's go ahead and hook up our ignition alligator clip. I threw a little gas in the carburetor. All right, let's see what happens. Huh, there must be a thermostat in here. We're not warm enough to open that up. I'm also not seeing any fuel come out. That could be an issue. I'm just gonna open this thermostat up manually. That should flow enough. Apparently my jumper wire for the ignition between the coil and the points uh, couldn't handle the juice. That fried. So I put a thicker wire on there with real connectors and uh, let's try it again. <laughs> I'm 
the way that flushed out the engine. I didn't see a whole lot of dirt, but I'm gonna keep doing that. That seems like a good way to uh, clear out all the sediment that's built up from something that's been sitting. Uh, I also don't see any leaks except for the hoses and stuff I hooked up here, none from the engine. So uh, that's a bonus. The fuel pump doesn't seem to work. So that's not good, but that's not too hard to fix or bypass. So it looks like I have an engine ready to drop into that truck. That's a project for another day because I got a little bit of work to do on the engine bay before I drop this one in there. But at least I know I have something to drop in and uh, it's gonna work. Now up to the point of working on the bow housing and shortly after I got that back together, I had a lot of fun on this video. I had a great drive up into the mountains. It's nice to hear this thing run and we made some progress and we know we can get that uh, mutt truck going. So I'm gonna call this a massive win. I uh, hope you guys are having fun in your projects too. We'll see you next time. I'm gonna run this thing a little longer.